Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Here I am, actually on a Tuesday, making a tag video, this time Tag de France, in which I'm celebrating not only Tag Tuesday and the Tour de France and Summer of Sport, but Jane Austen July. Yes, all my answers are going to be related to Jane Austen, which I admit is going to be a slight challenge here. But let's see if I can actually do it. On top of that craziness, you're going to have to listen to me butchering the French in these prompts. The brilliant tag created by the wonderful Gavin as Genre Books has 10 prompts. So let's get rolling straight away. First, Le Grand Depart. Name a memorable preface, introduction, or opening line. I love this prompt. One of my father's very favorite games was reciting great openings. He had a real knack for remembering the amazing first lines of hundreds of books. I'm afraid I don't have that skill, but one opening I do quote very often is the start of Jane Austen's masterpiece, Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. I love the humor of that line. I can almost hear the mothers of unmarried young women snarkily saying that and wanting it to be true only because they wanted their own daughters to make socially advantageous matches with these men. It wasn't the men who wanted it, or even the young women, but the mothers. But this claim was also, at least to a degree, probably true much of the time. Men in the upper classes typically held off from marriage until they had enough money to support a family, often until their mid to late 20s. And they had been waiting for quite a while by the time they were in the financial position to be able to court someone seriously. I can imagine that by then they probably were in want of a spouse, perhaps even a particular partner they'd been waiting for for years. Incidentally, I was thrilled to see that Reading Ideas gave this same response in his great version of this tag. Prompt number two, The Malavere, a book under 150 pages. I first read Jane Austen's short work, The History of England, only a few years ago. And while it is quite small, it is also quite amusing. She wrote it when she was about 15 years old, and she created it a sort of a parody of the school textbook version of English history. Her sister Cassandra provided the colored illustrations. This version of English history is intensely personality driven, where we see caricatures essentially of the kings and queens of England. Austin puts very little emphasis on dates, but a lot of emphasis on the lives of these royals, especially women. Austin's portrayal of Queen Elizabeth is noteworthy. I think I might have appreciated Austen's history of England even more if I had been familiar with the style of textbooks at the time, but this little book is funny and charming even without that knowledge. The third prompt, King of the Mountains, a book that you persevered with and are glad you did. Well, first, a little background. I first fell in love with Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, and Emma when I was fairly young. I'll talk about this in a future video, but Sense and Sensibility was my favorite of the three for at least a couple of years. My mother stored her teaching copies of these books on the bookshelves in my bedroom. I didn't quite realize Austin had written other books. Those three lonely Austen novels sat on the shelf right next to Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights by the Bronte sisters. Yep, you can check off on your bingo card if you're a regular viewer here. So when we were visiting a big city one time, Philadelphia, I think, I visited a used bookstore and much to my surprise found two more Austen novels that I didn't know existed, Northanger Abbey and Mansfield Park. I immediately started the latter novel, and I really wanted to have more time for the main protagonist to live at home with her poor family. I hated that she was mistreated after she was sent away. It all seemed just horrible. And then suddenly, it was a romance, which was just all wrong. So I put it aside for a while. I gave it another try, maybe a year later, 
knowing that the protagonist's life at home with her parents and siblings was not what Austin was going to be writing about. And going into it with that knowledge helped me change my mind about the book completely. Over the years, I've really come to appreciate some of the issues Austin addresses in Mansfield Park. Interestingly, I think it might have been the first book I ever DNF'd, and also the first time I eventually came back to a book to try again. Prompt number four, Malojean, a book where yellow is prominent. Well, prominent might be an overstatement, but Rory Muir's new book, Love and Marriage in the Age of Jane Austen, begins with an anecdote taken from one of her letters to her sister. In it, Jane Austen imagined how her heroines in Pride and Prejudice might dress, and yellow is important here. Let me read that beginning paragraph out to you. A few months after Pride and Prejudice was published, Jane Austen visited her brother Henry in London. It was the spring of 1813, and among other pleasures of the capital, the Austens went to an art exhibition at Spring Gardens, where Jane discovered a portrait that was, quote, excessively like Jane Bennett, or rather Jane Bingley, as she had become. Mrs. Bingley's is exactly herself, size, shaped face, features, and sweetness. There was never a greater likeness. She is dressed in a white gown with green ornaments, which convinces me of what I always supposed, that green was a favorite color with her. The author resolved to look for a portrait of Elizabeth, Mrs. Darcy, at the next exhibition they went to. I dare say Mrs. D will be in yellow. However, she was disappointed. Nothing resembling a portrait of Mrs. Darcy was to be found. Reflecting upon this, she was not really surprised. I can only imagine that Mr. D prizes any picture of her too much to like it should be exposed to the public eye. I can imagine he would have that sort of feeling, that mixture of love, pride, and delicacy. And then the author continues that this is a rare glimpse of the way Austen looked at the married lives of her protagonist. Muir's book is my first read of Jane Austen July, and I'm really loving it. There are moments when it almost feels like I'm reading a newly discovered Austen book. I mean, this is legitimate social history, and it doesn't have the great humorous voice of the Austen narrator, but it's filled with stories and words from people who lived during the period, who all very much feel like the side characters in an Austen novel. And in fact, some of them might have even served as inspiration for a few of Austen's side characters, I suspect. I highly recommend this book if you're still looking to add something to your TBR this month. The fifth prompt, Lantern Rouge, a book you were late to. As I said earlier, I first read most of Austen's novels when I was young, three books when I was 12 or 13, and then all but one of the others before I left for college. The last was Persuasion. I don't think I read it until after I had graduated from college. More than other Jane Austen novels, Persuasion is about mature love, I guess. And the main female protagonist is honestly more like me than any of her other protagonists. Kind of quiet, someone who doesn't like ruffling other people's feathers, and someone who behaves in kind of conventional ways, even if we aren't conventional thinkers. Like me, she also has an independent streak that eventually leads her to make decisions for herself. And in no time, Persuasion was one of my six favorite major Austen novels. Prompt number six, or category. What's the hardest book that you've read or failed to read? Well, in general, Jane Austen's books are not at all hard to read. Still, I do remember when my spouse David read his first Austen novel after my son and I pushed him to read Pride and Prejudice. He found the initial chapter surprisingly off-putting and just didn't get hooked when he first started. Jane Austen's prose was different from anything he had read before. Abe and I begged him to give it a little bit longer before he gave up, 
And of course, within just a few minutes, it all snapped into place and he was giggling aloud on the couch next to us for the rest of the evening. So if you are new to Jane Austen, don't be shocked if it takes a chapter or two to feel comfortable in the prose, but don't have any fear that it's going to feel hard for much longer than that. You will very quickly be at home in her world. The closest you could come to something less than comfortable in the world of Jane Austen might be emotional or topical. In general, we think of Austen as clever and light, but that isn't really the whole story. So how about for this question, the forthcoming book, The Dark Side of Jane Austen, coming out at Halloween by the author Angela Youngman. I'm excited to see the finished book. But for now, let me just read out the cover description. Jane was aware of the evils of society, of the problems faced by women, whether single or married. Underneath the entertaining storylines are much darker aspects of Regency in Georgian life. Staying single resulted in serious problems for young women. There were very few alternatives open to them, while marriage itself resulted in other risks. The threats of poverty, or becoming a victim of crime were also an issue. Other problems society faced included those posed by opium addiction, poor medical standards, and a lack of property, leaving young men and women struggling to survive. Many sought solutions in India, leading to the creation of fishing fleets with girls sent to marry total unknowns. Meanwhile, the issues of slavery brought more problems and social disorder was rife. I can't wait to read this book. The seventh prompt, Endurance, your favorite series. Now this prompt nearly made me abandon my plans for this crazy mashup of the Tour de France and Jane Austen July. A series of Jane Austen? Is there one? But then it hit me that Austen is totally associated with several famous series, just not the kind I was thinking about. Instead, mini series. As for so many of you, especially people of my age, nothing could take top billing in my heart than the 1995 six part BBC mini series of Pride and Prejudice, starring the incomparable Colin Firth and Jennifer Ely. Do you agree? Tell me in the comments which mini series or standalone screen adaptation, if you must, is your favorite. Prompt number eight, Champs-Élysées, your favorite Paris book. Well, you might not be surprised to learn that there is no terrific Paris novel by Jane Austen, but there is a book that might do in response to this prompt, In Paris with Jane Austen by Vera Quinn. This is essentially a cross between a scholarly work and a guidebook. It traces three walks through the City of Lights, where visitors can see the locations of homes and businesses of the early translators and publishers and libraries and booksellers of French translations of the works of Jane Austen. But other historical circumstances are key in this book, too. The book is more exciting than you might imagine, tracing the history of the extraordinary speed from publication in English to publication in French much of it pirated or unofficial. Surprisingly, war didn't really stand in the way. And in fact, some of the quick translations were based specifically on English copies conveyed on cartel ships that were designed to exchange French and English prisoners of war. In addition to talking about the process of multiple quick translations flooding the Parisian market, the author compares the different versions of Austen's books themselves, too, showing that the works often used less subtle prose, but more overtly romantic plots. Perhaps plot styles modeled on French authors who were Austen's main competition when it came to Parisian readers. Okay, the last substantive prompt is Lance Armstrong. Have you ever cheated with a book? to get to the end quicker. Not exactly, but I did find a way to quote, finish a book early, only by just not actually finishing it at all. It was not a Jane Austen book, 
but wildly, it led directly to a Jane Austen book. Years ago, when I was first dating David and had taken the train up to visit him in Philadelphia, he gave me a copy of his favorite book at the time, a legal thriller. He wasn't much of a reader at that point yet. He told me I would be shocked by the ending. I would never see it coming. So I read the first chapter under duress and told him the ending was telescoped very clearly and that I already knew who the killer was. He said I couldn't know who done it. So I told him what I was thinking. He slowly shook his head, both impressed and disappointed. The cheating I did was only that I paid close attention to what was happening in that first chapter, not at all the cheating of peeking at the back of the book or anything like that. But it does break thriller rules, I'm told, to be trying to figure things out in the very first few pages. I did not know how the crime was going to happen, but it was clear who was going to commit it. So instead of having to slog through the whole thriller, I took my well-worn copy of Northanger Abbey out of my bag and spent that October weekend rereading it. I guess in Austin, readers usually know what's going to happen at the end too, but that in no way makes it less worthy of reading and rereading. Okay, we finally come to the end of the road, to the celebratory final prompt. And now we've crossed the finish line of the tag, Le Keep. Here we get to have a glass of water or champagne and thank our team where we tag some fellow booktubers. First, let me make it very clear that if I tag you, you only need to do the normal tag here, not talk about Jane Austen. I'd like to tag anyone who has read a novel in French in the last few years. I'm afraid I haven't been paying attention to that issue when I've been watching, and I don't remember who might qualify, but I'll start with Elizabeth from the channel Bookwins and Books and Anne Novella. Thank you all so much for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.